Hi, everyone. Welcome to Happy to See Me, the podcast that puts the spotlight on the overlooked and underestimated. I am Erica Kasupinen, and today I am talking to Filipino Canadian content creator, TV reporter, and advocate for the visually impaired community, Mara Hutchinson. But first, I love to start each episode by talking about something I was happy to see this week. And I am fresh returning from a business trip. I was in New Brunswick. So if you are Canadian, you know that New Brunswick is in Atlantic Canada. And if you're not from Canada, New Brunswick is on the east coast of Canada. For any American listeners, it is beside Maine and New Hampshire. This is my first time ever going to that part of Canada, let alone going to New Brunswick. I got the opportunity to speak at a HR conference. So it was the CPHR conference in Atlantic Canada. So thank you so much for inviting me. And I love doing keynote speaking. I was nervous this time around because the speech I delivered was actually a brand new speech that I wrote, rehearsed, and prepared for this event. So it was the first time I ever shared this speech in front of anybody. Note to self, make sure I read speeches in front of people before talks now. It'll really lessen my anxiety. So I was the opening keynote speaker, and I wrote this speech where I talked about the journey to becoming the first. As many people listening to the podcast know, I was the first Canadian to win Survivor. So I talk about what the journey really is like to become the first. I talk about overcoming obstacles and feeling like the underdog in many parts of my life. And I talk about how we need to make sure we are unlocking the magic within ourselves and the people around us. But what I was really happy to see were all of the conversations that I had with people after. And I'm truly so thankful to everybody from this conference who came up and spoke to me after. And I thought what was so interesting is I wrote this speech. I had all of these messages in mind. But then I learned once you say the speech, it kind of takes on a life of its own. And then people interpret it in the way that is most valuable to them. And I was so touched because I had so many people who came up and talked to me and they told me about how they related to my speech for different reasons. I had people talking about how they related because they were immigrants or people of color or women or people who have felt bullied or have felt like they've been underdogs or have felt like they've been misunderstood. And it was so cool to see that it was all these different people with different identities still relating to that same experience of feeling like you have the odds stacked against you in some way. I talk about some of the people who were positive influences on me during my journey to become the first and my journey afterwards. And I even had people who said that they were so inspired by hearing of the people around me and how they want to make sure that they were a positive influence. So I think what it really taught me is we're all human, even though we might seem different in all these ways. Oh my God, this is starting to sound like a TED talk, but follow me. Even though we seem so different in all of these ways, there is so much that we actually have in common. Through telling stories and being open and vulnerable about things like that, we have the opportunity to connect and help people to see themselves in different ways and ways that you couldn't imagine. It was really inspirational for me to see how the different stories I told created all of these different thoughts, feelings, and conversations with different people. And it really inspired me to continue on with the work that I do as a keynote speaker and honestly, even with this podcast. So what I was happy to see this week were all of the kind, generous, and open conversations I had when I was in New Brunswick. And I was so happy to see how even stories from someone who is so different from you can still completely touch you and inspire you. So thank you to everybody who welcomed me to the East Coast and who came up and spoke to me. Speaking of inspirational stories, today I'm speaking with Mara Hutchinson. Mara is an incredible Filipino-Canadian content creator, TV reporter, and an advocate for the visually impaired community. And in this episode, she is telling her story of being diagnosed with a rare eye condition when she was 28 that caused her to lose her vision. So she opens up about the judgments and perceptions that she receives as a blind person. And she talks about how vision loss affected her relationship with her partner and with her son. She talks about the grief of having a disability and coming to terms with losing her vision. She also talks about doing all of this with incredible style. And she also talks about this amazing campaign she was just part of with Barbie, 
Barbie recently launched a blind Barbie, and there's this amazing Canadian-designed fashion line that complemented the Barbie launch, and Mara got to be a model for this Barbie campaign. So if you know anybody who is dealing with disabilities, major life changes, or might feel misunderstood or like they're an underdog in any way, I highly recommend you share this episode with them because I think Mara will be incredibly inspirational to them. Let's just get into it. Here is my interview with Mara Hutchinson. I hope you enjoy it. Mara, welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Online, your handle is Ate Mara, so not a Mara. And for anyone listening who is not familiar with Mara, she is a fellow Filipino. I know there's lots of Filipino people listening. So can you explain what Ate Mara means? I'm glad you pointed out that it's not A Mara. A lot of people actually think that it's A Mara, but it's not. It means big sister in the Philippine culture. And my siblings have always called me Ate Mara, my cousins. And I feel like with the platform, I'm someone's friend. I'm someone's big sister. And I just went with it. I'm everybody's Ate Mara. Yes, you definitely are. Yes, you have such Ate energy. Even when I look at everything you do online, I'm like, this is big sister energy. You are teaching us so many things. So I'm so happy to have you on the show today. I'm so happy to be here, Erica. So I met you a few months ago now. It was at an accessibility event. And you were sharing your story of being diagnosed with a disease that gave you severe vision loss. Can you tell me the story of your diagnosis? So I was diagnosed with a rare eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa about almost 14 years ago now. So I was born with this, but the way the condition works is that it can always appear early on the years or middle age. It doesn't matter when, but Officially, I was diagnosed almost 14 years ago. Retinitis pigmentosa is pretty much a genetic disease where it causes me to lose most of my vision now. The best way to really describe the actual condition is that it's like looking through a very, very small straw. Let's say a kid's juice box. You lose your peripheral vision. You have night blindness. And whatever you see in that super small straw is what's left of the vision. But in my case, everyone's RP is different. The way my RP is, is that I barely see anything in that supposedly small hole in my left. So it's just a little outlines and blob on my left side now. So I can't really see anything anymore on that end. But my right eye only has about 5% left. And that's what I'm pretty much hanging on to with retinitis pigmentosa. And then I was also diagnosed shortly after with Usher syndrome. So I'm also losing my hearing. So it's connected. Wow. Yeah, I don't talk about it that much. It took me a long time to accept RP. So it's mm. not that I have accepted Usher. It's just more so at this point in my life now where there is no treatment, no cure for the condition. It's just kind of going along with it. You know what I mean? Like going with the flow of things and it is what it is. But I do also have Usher syndrome and slowly losing my hearing as well. How old were you when you got this diagnosis? So I am now turning 42. I was honestly fully diagnosed about 20. I was about 28. I was just newly engaged, trying to figure out what is really happening with my vision because I was not able to see in the dark when I'm out clubbing back in the day, partying and movie theaters. Dim places really scared me because I couldn't see anything. And I thought it was mainly because, oh my gosh, it's time to get new glasses, time to get a regular checkup again, my new prescription. Until I really spoke up and said to my eye doctor, I was like, I don't think um, I'm able to really see well, even if I have my glasses, because if I'm looking straight at somebody or at something, I can't see anything in my size, meaning I don't have my peripherals. So after speaking out and really discussing a lot of things, he sent me to my first specialist, my retina specialist. And then from that first specialist, I had to get a second opinion and then kind of just figure out other doctors who could really tell me what this is. Because mm -hmm. my first specialist said I have a retina issue. 
and I'm going blind, not really giving me a full answer of what this is. So I think that played a huge part of how I took the news because my first ever doctor, my specialist doctor, showed me a picture of my eyes, the test and everything saying, this is your eyes. It was like the visual picture was, there was not much in the center and everything was black on the side and wow. said, you're going blind and there's nothing you can do. So like, I'm trying to process things and hearing my first ever doctor say those words, I was like, what? So my fiance at the time and my mom said, no, we're going to ask, we're going to get a second opinion because we need answers, right? That somebody can't just tell you you're going blind and not really knowing what this is, right? So mm -hmm. it took a long time to really get the best specialist and full answers. And February of 2011, my specialist at Sunnybrook Hospital told me that it is retinitis pigmentosa and she has been the best doctor ever since. Wow. I can imagine that was probably so scary, especially at 28. So you've had your childhood, your teen years, your adult life. You've met your partner that you want to marry. And then to get this news, do you remember how you were feeling the first time the doctor said you're going blind? I, I felt scared because I know I did, but mm -hmm. I felt like, what? Am I allowed to swear here? Yes, 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 yes. I was like, what the fuck is going on? Because he legit just said, you're going blind and there's nothing you can do. Because we're trying to get answers. After we said, okay, so what do we do? So there's nothing you can do. So mm -hmm. I think it took me a long time to process that because as we all know, to get another specialist appointment, it takes a long time. So I think it took a few more months for us to actually figure out what was really going on. So all I had was that answer from my first retina specialist saying, you're going blind. But it's like, what does that mean? Like, obviously we all know what that means, but it's like, what is my future? What is happening? So many emotions, so many feelings that I was dealing with that I couldn't really process everything because, you know, you're thinking about your future. You're in this high life of, oh my gosh, I just got engaged. You know, mm -hmm. we're about to just plan a lot of things and you get this kind of news. I thought it was just like, oh, you know, maybe we could fix it by surgery. No, it wasn't the case. So it really caused me into a deep, deep depression. Yeah. I know I've said it many times where it led me to being suicidal. Wow. And a lot of dark, dark moments. Last year, I interviewed Taylor, aka Access by Tay. I know you know Taylor. We love Taylor. If anybody's listening and they're not familiar with her, go back and listen to the episode because Taylor tells the story about how she got in this gymnastics accident as a teen and then found out that she was paralyzed from the chest down and had to live in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And I remember in the interview, she was telling me it was almost like there was this resistance initially where she knew other people live in wheelchairs, but that's not me. I'm not a person with a disability. Did you have that initial resistance as you were going through this diagnosis? Oh, 100%. I feel like because we take things a lot of for granted, right? And I never imagined in my life I would be a disabled person and mm -hmm. losing my vision and not be able to really see well. And it's a scary feature because I can completely go blind. I'm only hanging on to 5%. And I just never saw myself to be this, you know, we've always learned and we know disabled people or we know mm -hmm. when we see that symbol of somebody in the wheelchair that, okay, that is for disabilities, right? But I never imagined my life to be this way. And it's like trying to really adjust and navigate this new life because I'm not that person anymore. We talk about grieving of a loved one, but this is grieving of what my life was before and what yeah. now I can't have, right? I mean, I never really had a chance to drive and just really be fully independent and not always scared to be out and about. And I just never once thought my life would be this way. It, it's a scary, scary thought and still is. And I just never thought, and I agree with Taylor, we never thought our life would be this way. And you wouldn't want that, yeah, right? A hundred percent. No one imagines that. I think for many people who are able-bodied, 
they know that there are people with disabilities. But again, you see it as something that's so separate from yourself. And when you get this diagnosis, I think that as somebody who is fortunate to be able-bodied, I would think, okay, now I have to adjust to how do I move around the world? But it sounds like there's also this huge identity shift that needs to happen too. Now you are proudly talking about living with vision loss and you're proudly advocating. How did you go from going through almost this identity crisis to now accepting and embracing that you have this disability? I think for me, honestly, Erica, is more so this is the life now. Mm -hmm. What do I do about it? Am I going to be stuck continuing to be the way I was before when I learned that I will go completely blind? I'm losing my vision and my hearing and be cooped up in that room that I was always in and just not hang out with family or hang out with anybody. How do I go about that? Am I going to be this way? I have to really learn to navigate who I am now and accept that this is the life and what am I going to do about it? Am I going to be always stuck at home crying and let myself go? Because if that's the case, then I would be the only one missing out. The world still goes on, right? Mm -hmm. So how do mm -hmm. we go about it? It's either accepting it and try to build the life that I feel like I deserve and want for myself. That's just the only way to really go about it. Every day is a challenge. Every day is a challenge for everybody. But it's how I get up and tell myself, you know what? You just got to make the best of it. And it's not easy. It took me a long, long time. And even to this day, there are times when I don't want to wake up. There are times when I'm mm -hmm. just like, oh my gosh, like I'm honestly dreading the winter days. The winter days are the worst for the disabled community. And whether you're visually impaired on the wheelchair, anybody will tell you that winter days mm -hmm. is the most awful times for us because it makes us just feel like we're stuck at home because of what's out there. Not many things are very accessible to us. But for yeah. me personally, I just tell myself, you've come so far and you are creating the life that you feel like is best for you. That's what I just tell everybody. It's not easy. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, pick up your white cane and learn to just be independent. It took me a long time to do that. Well, not just many things, but people are not very friendly. So in general, we get these feels of we're terrified and just to be independent. But you have to do what you have to do for us, for me. And that's probably a scary feeling because you were 28. You could live independently and go anywhere at any time of the year and never had to think about it before. And now it's something you need to think about. As an able body or regular people, we plan many things or even let's say just to travel. We plan that. But now it's like extra things that we got to consider and plan because of our own needs. Mm -hmm. And when we travel, even traveling downtown in the city, it's always an up and downs feeling because it's what we're running into, right? And mm -hmm. the people and if that place is accessible for us, it's always we got to figure out if this is going to be comfortable for me, if this is going to be easy for me or works well for us. I want to ask about accessibility. When I think about accessibility and I used to work in tech, I think about things like described video, the things that would play before the TV show saying that described video were available or working in tech, how there was always alt text for images or braille. But what are accommodations, especially for people who are visually impaired, that a lot of people don't really think about, but that would be extremely helpful? I'm going to touch base on social media because I feel like uh, a lot of us or everyone is always make things accessible. So I love how we always turn on our captions no matter what. So that's obviously, it works well for me because I do... Obviously, I am losing my hearing as well, but it just works best or even for the visually impaired because at least the font is extra big for us and we know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, it's the way people put their font because mm -hmm. some colors, some things won't work well for my vision or for most people's vision. And video describe at least there, if you can't see what you're looking at fully and can't see well, it's going to describe what am I looking at, right? What What is Erica holding up or what does she look like? I know what you mean. You know, we always see these type of things growing up, but we never really know until, like mm -hmm. I said, now that it's happened to me, now it makes sense. Now we're learning. Now we're all talking about many things about the disabled community and what works well. To me, it's just so cool that all of us are now speaking up and really educating a lot of people, everybody, what 
can be accommodating what works well for all of us. So mm-hmm. video descriptions, it's a cool game changer of how things are now when everyone is trying to do their best to really accommodate everybody. But if you're going to ask me when I go to certain places, I like to make sure that that place is lit up. Yeah. A yeah. lot of lights, whether I'll have my sunglasses on, if it's too, too much for me, I could put on my sunglasses. But at least it leads the way for me and I could see better when it, the place mm-hmm. is lit up versus being in a dark, dim place. I like no stairs, no steps. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, easy access to a lot of things, right? And you just got to be mindful of where I'm going or how your business is going in terms of is it going to accommodate everybody, the disabled community as well. It's one of those things you don't know until someone tells you. Like, I'm sure people love the idea of a restaurant that's dark and moody and a sexy feeling, but then not realizing that for someone with a condition like yours, that actually creates a barrier for you to join. Even when I think about podcasting, I know that a lot of podcasters want all the conversation to be off the cuff and feel really natural, and I get it. I usually send people questions ahead of time, even if we don't follow the questions 100%. Even in this conversation, we haven't followed the questions 100%. But I had a guest last year, and then afterwards, they told me that they were neurodivergent, and it's really helpful for them to see the questions ahead of time because then they can be focused and be in the right headspace. And I'm like, okay, this is like, a simple thing that I would have never thought of before that makes it easier. So it's great to see that you're advocating and opening our eyes, I guess, to all of the things we didn't realize that we could be doing to make things more accessible. Oh, 100%. And I mean, some people will love the questions because I get very anxious. For me personally, just planning ahead. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think about other people's conditions and so on. But I mean, everyone works best in their own needs. I prefer you don't have to send me anything. I'm cool to always just chatting it up. Mm -hmm. But it's good that you also do this because you never know. I could be so nervous that day and I'm like, what am I, how am I feeling today? I just work best as well planning ahead because I have really raising anxiety sometimes. One question that we were talking about before we were recording, and I hope that you can help to dispel this myth, but I think a lot of people, when they think of someone being legally blind, they think this person cannot see at all. Can you explain what it actually means to be legally blind? Well, the biggest thing about when people say they're legally blind is that it really is just based on the law, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that limit us from doing things because of the severe loss of their vision. And it's also obviously we don't see 2020. But with a lot of our conditions, it limits us to doing many things. And mainly, obviously, we can't be on the road. So that's pretty much what Legally Blind is, that there's a lot of things that I can't do, but it doesn't mean that I also can't see. Because not many understand is that when people say they're blind, it doesn't mean that we're completely blind. There's only about 2% of the world's population that are legit completely blind. But many people that have eye conditions, they see something, whether it's lights, outlines, or maybe holding on to just like 5% vision or 3%. We see something, but it's obviously not the way regular people will see. People out there tend to kind of just say, well, if you're blind, then why are you able to do this or do that? It doesn't mean that I'm completely blind, but I do have severe vision loss. When I say I'm legally blind, there's a lot of things that I can't obviously do by law Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. of the severe loss that I have now with my vision. I think that also with someone like you, people probably don't associate being legally blind with being the social media content creator or being legally blind and having an incredible sense of style. And if anyone is listening and they haven't been on Mara's Instagram, go check it out. It's Ate Mara and you will see incredible style. Even the first time I met you, I think my first question was, where did you get your outfit? How do people respond to you having this style? Well, first of all, if you don't know me and you're probably just seeing me out and about and you ask, because there's a lot of people have asked, like, oh, what is your, what is this cane for? And then I explain to them that, you know, I'm legally blind. I can't see well. Oh, you're blind? But then how do you look like that, right? Already, it's always that saying of like, you're faking it. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like in this world and society is that if you're considered disabled, you have a certain look. Whether you're visually impaired, 
whether you're on a wheelchair or if they have what they think is a disabled look, why can't mm-hmm. we all look amazing and feel good and wear these fabulous clothes or whatever our style is, right? Why can't we wear those type of things? And everyone's always just mind blown where they just can't imagine that you're blind or you're disabled because you look like this. Because again, there's always a certain look that people think disabled people should have. And what is that look? Like, do you think that I can't properly put myself together? Or like, I don't even know what that look is that they want me to look like. Because if they mm-hmm. see me out and about, they're shocked. They're always yeah. shocked. And I'm like, I don't, I've always been this way. I've always, even before being diagnosed, I've always been expressive with what I'm wearing, with my style. Mm-hmm. I always have my nails done. People are shocked that to this day, I sit here for almost three hours doing my own nails. It may not be the best, but I try to still do things that I do enjoy and love even before being diagnosed. Obviously, a lot of things are harder now, but I don't want to lose all of me. I've always been this way. I've always been into feeling good and expressing how I dress with my personality or what I'm feeling that day. It's all about how how I feel. And I don't care if... I'm wearing something that's like years, years ago, as long as I feel good. I think that's part of what makes your style pop in that it isn't necessarily on trend. It's just so clear that it's your point of view and what you want to be wearing. And honestly, keep doing you. And I totally hear you. You lose so much when you realize you have this disability. Why lose something that's so important to you, like fashion and the way that you express yourself? So Keep holding on. And if people are shocked, let them be shocked. Well, that's what I always say. I'm like, I don't want to have to change who I am or what I love. Being a disabled person doesn't mean that you can't do anything. Like, we're still human beings. I'm still able to enjoy going out and having a brunch date. I love brunch date. I love having a coffee with a friend. And that's just me. I always say I'm more than my disabilities because I am, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am a disabled person and it's a huge part of me, but it doesn't define everything about me. I am so much more, right? I'm so much more. And I always want to tell everybody what makes you special, though. Like, I'm advocating, yes, for my disabilities, but I'm advocating for everything else about me. The things that I enjoy, the things that I love doing or just being alone, let's say, or just who I am in general, right? I mean... That's what I always want people to know is that you can still be whatever you want to be or have the life that you want, even being a disabled person. I want to ask about your relationships because I know you mentioned that your fiance was with you when you got the diagnosis. Now you're married, so spoiler alert, they stayed together. And recently on social media, I saw you use the term interabled relationship. So can you explain what this means? First of all, this is when you know you're learning so much. If I didn't become disabled, I would have never really understood all the tech stuff, let's say, to make things accessible, right? I didn't even realize this until recently as well, because... I was doing a webinar class and I was just sharing about, you know, my relationship. So Baz and I met when we were about 18, 19 years old, where I'm turning 42. So we've been together ever since. And I asked him, first of all, I asked him if this was okay with you, if we still wanted to marry me. Because it's very important for someone like Baz going into a relationship and committing a lifetime relationship with somebody that has this condition that is like forever changing Mm -hmm. and it's going to be a huge impact in our lives right so I asked him I'm like okay so this is what's happening do you still want to marry me and a lot of people were shocked when they heard this because they're like why wouldn't he marry you but then I'm also letting him know that this is a big responsibility and it's only fair that Mm -hmm. I asked him because you never know right you just never know and it's going to change all of our lives he still wanted to marry me. He still said we could still have the life that we want. So pretty much what it means is that it is somebody that has a disability and your partner doesn't have a disability. I also learned that you can both have disabilities, but they're different. But more so everyone mm-hmm. is more common to people that are married to somebody that are not disabled. So that's what it really is. But I'm just very blessed that, my gosh, that he still wanted to marry me. Not just because... 
I'm a disabled person, but I'm I'm a crazy one. I'm too much. Uh, Erica, I'm too extra. But I always tell them like, man, we've been through so much. And it's like, I am just an extra girl. And yeah, yeah, I can't believe you're still here. But he is. You know what? Honestly, everyone listen to the Taylor episode if you haven't already, because Taylor and I became friends. And she told me, and I've always remembered this, that realistically, if we are all fortunate enough to live long enough, everyone is going to require some type of accessibility when we get older we're going to have issues with mobility we're going to get sick something is going to happen where if we have a partner they're going to need to help us and at least with you and baz you know you don't have to wait until you're older to know that he's going to be there for you and to help you out he already has shown it so it's already like great amazing boxes checked so i'm so happy you found that partner i'm honestly i don't know where life would be i I don't know where i would be without him i really don't and i mean there are times when i ask him like my gosh like imagine if we didn't meet do you think somebody Mm -hmm. would want to be with a disabled person because it's always a question right i'm just very blessed that he is in my life When you're going through that big transition, I know that it affects family. So in case there's anybody that's listening and they have somebody that's going through a major change or they're discovering that they have a disability, what is something that went well in terms of how your friends and family supported you? And what's something that someone could have done better? Oh, man, this is opening up a lot of things. I feel like you really have to really communicate. If I don't communicate with my family, like my brothers and my sisters and my parents and like even Baz of like the things that will help me or how to go about a certain thing or what I need, then they won't understand, right? And I feel like even if you do express what is happening to you or what you need or what you don't need, some people can not understand still and then they could walk away because I've had people walk away. Those people were never meant to be in my life to begin with. I always say is that you can't please or make everybody happy, right? And I can't always be pleasing people for the sake of whatever else. To me, it's like what my needs or what I need to get out there matters. And if those people are able to understand that, then yeah. So I just do my best to really express that today I feel like some things are changing with my vision and I may need this. Or everybody already knows that I like to have all the lights on if we're at someone's house hanging out. Or if, let's say, I'm hanging out with my brother and my sister and they invite me to go somewhere, they will tell me, oh, well, you know, this place is so and so, but you can do this because it's not fully accessible for you. Like, I recently went to a wedding and my brother was a groomsman for that wedding and he messaged me and he said, oh, Ate, I'm actually here now. Make sure that you do this and the washrooms are not really... You know, it's, just, it's those portable washrooms, so you may, it's maybe a little tricky. So they give me like a heads up of like what my surroundings will be like because I always let them know like this is what's going to be best for me or how I want certain things. And even like with my son and, you know, what will mommy need? Because if I don't communicate, then they're never going to understand. And then it's going to mm-hmm. be that battle of like, oh, well, they're not here for me or this and this and that, and then I'm just going to be more frustrated with life, right? My best advice is that to really communicate with your loved ones. They obviously need to know what's happening and how can they be helpful for you. And that's just how it is. And then I feel like everything else will follow. Excellent advice. And I think don't be afraid to ask questions either. If you're with somebody who has a disability and you don't know, that one is a good one too. Like always ask questions. And you know, sometimes... I do get upset when people ask dumb questions, but then, you know, at the same time, not many people really understand. So questions are never dumb. Mm -hmm. And I just tell myself, you know what, Mara, they're just being considerate. They're not being that mean person. They just really want to know, right? Mm -hmm. And not everybody knows what this white cane really is sometimes, right? Or what can you see? So it's good to always ask questions as well. I want to ask about your son because you have a beautiful son. You were saying you just dropped him off at school. How has having a disability affected motherhood? Do you feel like your son has had to learn to take on more responsibility or has it affected motherhood in other ways? Hey, first of all, I really have to point this out that my condition is obviously genetic. So there 
could be a chance that Rossi may have it. So when Baz and I got married, my specialist did ask if we were considering having kids. Because if that's the case, she's warning us that there could be a chance that our kids may have it. So it is one of those scary things where, oh my gosh, what if our future kids will have it? Baz and I knew that we wanted a family. And if we were blessed with one, then we're blessed. A lot of people do ask, especially in our Filipino culture, where, how come there's not another one? When are you going to have another one? Mm -hmm. There's a big reason why there isn't another one. And I only have a son because I was also given information by my specialist that if I am pregnant, I could lose more vision. There's a chance. And there was a chance. I mean, right. like, I really did lose more vision. So going through pregnancy and knowing that I'm losing more vision with the pregnancy, I told myself, I don't want to have another one because it's a scary feeling where what if I lose all my vision second pregnancy if I do have another kid? So that was a big decision for myself where I think I'm just, I'm happy with one. Becoming an actual mom, it was a scary feeling because all these things are going through my mind of like, what if I fall? Because there are times when I still fall and I bump into things. So it's just a lot of feelings of like, what if I do something wrong and I harm my kid? So as he got older and just the communication of letting him know that mommy has a condition, this is what it's called. So that's why we need to do this around the house make sure that everything is clear and nothing is on the floor so that I don't trip on anything, I don't fall or this and that. So he grew up where he always put his toys away. And if you mm. ever come to my house, even when he was a baby, you would think, my gosh, like there's no kid here, there's no baby. Because it is very neat, not because I'm a neat freak, but it's just because I can't have anything on the ground. No toys laying around. The toys have to be put away. Bronx grew up knowing that when he's done playing, he needs to put it away. When he's done, let's say, touching the remote control, he needs to put it back where it goes or things have to go back to where it goes so that mommy can find it easier. And it's those little things that he understands or turn on the light for mommy or this and that or he'll warn me, mommy, I left something here. Don't walk here. And it's because of the way I communicate with him. Yeah, he's young, but he's able to really understand that mommy can't see well, and this is what we need. And as he gets older, he's going to understand a lot more things. I mean, for six mm -hmm. years old, he knows a lot, and he knows to always remind me, mommy, don't forget your white cane, or, you know, don't forget your stick, or, or we're on the bus, and no one really gets up for us. And he'll be like, oh, but you're supposed to sit there, because it says disabled. So he knows a lot of things, and it's because of what we're teaching him and what works well for our family and what goes around the house, right? And that's the most important thing, like really communicating with him of uh, what mommy needs and what works best for us and what I need him to do. So it's really cool that he's able to really understand at such a young age. It sounds like he's such a big hearted little kid. He is, he's like a little person. His soul is like, he's a kid, but he is so mature in so many ways that it's amazing to see how he handles a lot of things. And it's mind-blowing because he is better than some adults out there, right? Just hearing about the way that your partner has supported you and the way that you are creating this empathy with your family and friends. Your kid is just going to grow up and be the sweetest angel ever. Did you meet him at the accessible event at Amazon? I think I saw him. I think that we were chatting and then he came up and talked to you. Oh my gosh, yeah, it was with you guys. I wanted him to be there. I really yeah. made yeah. sure that he was, like, if it was okay to bring him for the event because it's important for him to see all of us up there. I always teach him that having a disability, it just doesn't mean, like, being a legally blind person. Some but it can be in a wheelchair. Like I wanted him to really see everybody that was on the panel and just see how important we all are and making this huge change and just to see like your mom is up there, right? I was so happy that he was there. Kids need that. Kids need to yes. understand that there's a lot of us out there in this world and we matter. The representation is important. When it comes to kids and representation, you did something really fun recently with one of the most iconic brands for kids. You collaborated with Barbie and this Canadian designer called iDesign. So can you share more about this campaign? Okay, so Alexa, the founder of iDesign, she is actually from here, from Toronto. And we've been friends since 
many years ago. I always believed in her and I said, you're going to do incredible things. And when she reached out to me about this campaign, first of all, I didn't even know what this campaign was yet until she told me. I said, yes, I'm here, always here to help you out. And then she was, are you sure? And I said, yes. Eventually she told me the partnership is with Barbie and Mattel. Wow. And then I was like, what? And she goes, yes, Barbie and Mattel actually wants you to be one of the models. Because I guess the way it worked is that not just Alexa of iDesign wanting me to represent her brand, but she had to send in who she wants representing to Barbie and Mattel. And I guess as soon as Barbie and Mattel saw my profile, they said, sure, we want her. I couldn't believe that. I had happy tears, but I actually laughed as well because I was like, wow. Why would Barbie Mattel want me out of everybody that they could find to represent them? Maybe because I had that little bit of imposter fear, but more so at 41, what would they want from me, right? There's so many other amazing people, but no, Alexa said, no, Barbie wants you. So I said, okay, sure, let's do it then. Mm -hmm. And I think just the fact that for me to really be featured and have them really say that they want Mara and this and that means so much to me because I see the kids and I always say my big purpose to making the change is for the kids because there's so many kids out there who are visually impaired and if I've experienced a lot of hate and at my age still getting heat of being legally blind I can't imagine what these kids are going to go through if we don't make a change. And it's important for me to have them see themselves out there, see themselves in fashion with all these models in toys because we matter. Because I never saw that growing up. I never saw a lot of disabled people, whether they're in the fashion industry or in toys. And it's really only recently, in the last few years, we've seeing many changes happening slowly, but making change, right? And we're seeing a lot more disabled creators, disabled people really making big changes. When I look at the children now, we're doing all of this for them to see themselves in Barbies, to see themselves, you know what, there's finally a blind Barbie fashionista doll that these kids who are blind can play with. And honestly, I was blown away because it's been 65 years this year with Barbie. And this is the first time that they ever came up with this. And to be part of this history, that's why I was like, oh my gosh, I am just very honored that they wanted me to be one of the models. This campaign is truly, truly amazing. I'm going to link to this campaign and to iDesign in the show notes. Everyone can check it out because it's pretty incredible. It's like truly this beautiful Barbie that has the white cane. And then I was reading about all of the features in terms of the outfit that was designed. So it's like textures that are good for people who are visually impaired. The sunglasses, oh, it's amazing. And even with eye design, so the way that I is spelled is A-I-L-L-E. So I will also link to that collection as well. And you can see Mara modeling. It's incredible. And it honestly shows that you sticking to your love for fashion, even though most people don't associate fashion and blindness, it just makes total sense. And it shows that you were doing the right thing for yourself and living authentically. And then you get to do this amazing historic campaign. You know what? Alexa with iDesign, she always said fashion is for everyone. And when she did this whole collab with Barbie, it means the shirts and everything. It says Barbie is inclusive. What this brand stands for is pretty much, you know what? Like fashion is for everybody. Why limit that, right? Like Mm -hmm. it can be for everybody we're meant to be up there too, to represent everybody. So that's why it was such a huge campaign. And I'm just so truly honored that I was part of it. Part of this history of finally, like Barbie came out with the first ever a blind Barbie. And I'm just blown away. Like I honestly still can't believe it to this day that I was part of this history. Because again, I'm at this age and like, it's just incredible feeling. But yet it's like, It's an emotional one because I never had a chance to really play with Barbie. I told them this too, where I said, I never really had a chance to play with Barbie because that is a different story where immigrant parents couldn't afford things. Then all of a sudden it's like, I am now blind and I've been 
educating and I'm doing what I can to show the world that, you know what, we matter, we can still create the life that we want, that we deserve this. And then they wanted me to be part of it. And to me, it's like, that's amazing. And I'm just always here to just remind people, especially the children, that you guys can still have the life that you guys really do deserve and create. This is why we're doing what we're doing. It's for me personally, it's for them because I've experienced a lot of things in the almost 14 years of being blind that I can't imagine if things are not changing. I can't imagine the life that they're going to grow up in. I think that this is a lesson for everyone listening that your circumstances won't determine what happened because you are the immigrant girl who is now blind, who never grew up with Barbies, and you are in the Mattel Barbie high fashion campaign. So truly anything is possible if you stick with it and if you are true to yourself. Do you have any advice for anyone who's listening who might be adjusting to a big change, whether it's vision loss or any other major change? You know what? It's not easy, right? It's never easy. What I do want to say is that everything will always be okay. It's hard to believe, but everything will always be okay as long as we learn to accept it, whatever you're going through. Whatever struggles it is, it could be with vision loss or many other things, right? Learn to just accept it. But then how do we go about navigating the new life now? navigating this and trying to just go on with your life type of thing where it's never going to be easy. There's always going to be down days because life is not meant to be easy to begin with. But how do you go about it? How are you going to tell yourself that tomorrow you could handle it? Tomorrow will be a better day. It's really up to us though. And it took me a long time to really get that. And don't get me wrong. There are some days where I, I feel like fucking shit. But I don't want to be stuck there anymore where I completely lose hope and I didn't want to live. Because if I chose that path, I would have never experienced building a family, meeting incredible people, meeting you, just being here in general, right? You will lose out on what you is capable of doing or what you create for yourself. And for me personally, is that never lose hope because as much as it's so hard, there's always going to be some sort of pumping for you. But it's really up to us, though. How do we go about it? I don't know, man. For me, I just swim through it. I mean, I've experienced a lot of things, not just with my disabilities, but I tell myself all the time where you've handled a lot of things, why I just keep going? Because like, I don't yeah. know what else is going to break me. You know what I mean? And yeah. if something does, because, you know, life is meant to be up and down, it's just really trying to navigate it and swim through it. The resilience in you is so strong. Girl, I could talk to you about many, many things about what I've been through, but I just tell myself, you've already been here. Like, what else is going to happen, right? And you've come so far. And I think that's the most important thing to always remember. You've come so far that you are meant to be here. There's a reason, there's a purpose to why we're still here. And the many times I tried to give up and I'm still here, my gosh, there's a reason why. You know, we're trying to figure all that out and I feel like I know my purpose and I continue to just tell myself there's always something ahead and blessings ahead and even the life that we're creating. It's really such a tough thing to always accept every type of struggles that we're going through, but it's really just all in our minds and how do we go about it? That's excellent advice to end off on. Thank you so much, Mara, for being here and for being vulnerable and then sharing all of the ups and downs that have come with this journey. If people want to stick to your journey and follow along, where can they follow you? You can follow me on Instagram and that is Atimara. So it's A-T-E-M-A-R-A. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. And since you're my Ate, Maraming Salamat. If anyone's not Filipino, that's saying like many thank yous. Mara is so fantastic and inspirational. If you don't already, make sure you follow her on Instagram so you can check out her amazing style. And if you know someone who would be inspired by Mara's perseverance and how she's able to really embrace life where it is now, make sure you share this episode with them. So I love to end each episode by answering a listener question. But this week, I want to do something a bit different and answer a question that somebody asked me in person when I was in New Brunswick at the conference I talked about earlier. And somebody asked me about when you want to take that risk to get to the next level or make that change in your life, what do you tell yourself when you're afraid to do it? 
And I think that this is something that a lot of people have experienced. I know I have experienced it many times. And I had to really think about what is it that I say to myself? How do I tell myself to keep going, even if there might not even be proof that it's going to work out and that I can be successful? And I think the main thing is I just want to tell everybody you owe it to yourself to go for it. You have done a lot of work to get to the exact point that you are now. You have proven yourself wrong many times to get to the exact point that you are at now. And that person who was on that journey the whole time to get you to where you are now and to learn all the lessons you've learned up until now, you owe it to that person to take another risk and another step forward. You owe it to the person you are right now to take that step forward. And even the person that you know you could be, you owe it to yourself and you deserve it. Even as I think back to the interview with Mara and she talked about how she had to make the choice to build the life that she knows she wanted and she knows she deserves, you also have the opportunity to build the life that you deserve. I say, take the step and go for it. You owe it to yourself. You deserve it. The worst case scenario, you just pivot and do something else. If you've gotten to the point you're at now, I think you have what it takes to take another step and to take another risk. I hope that that's helpful. Again, I am no psychologist. I am but one person just trying my best to make people feel like they have what it takes to build the life that they want. So thank you so much to everybody for tuning in to this week's episode. And thank you so much to the person who asked me that question. If you haven't already, I would love if you could subscribe, rate, and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts because it helps other people find the show. We are on Instagram, YouTube, and on TikTok. It is at Happy to See Me Pod. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, and I will be happy to see you next Monday. <laughs>